All right, in this uh, video here, we're going to look at the Wittig reaction, and we're going to look at uh, oxidation reactions of ketones and aldehydes. Okay, so the reaction that you see at the top here is called the Wittig reaction. This is where we take a ketone or aldehyde and a phosphorane or phosphorus illid, okay, right here. And illid just means it has a positive and a negative charge present. And they're usually beside each other. Okay. In one step, the combination of these two reagents here produces an alkene. Okay. It will produce a mixture of E and Z. And it produces as a byproduct triphenylphosphine oxide. Okay. What's the mechanism for this reaction? All right. So the proposed mechanism involves nucleophilic attack at the carbonyl group like that to make the compound that has a O- minus and a triphenylphosphine plus present, and phosphorus is on the second row of the periodic table, so it can expand its octet in the way sulfur does, so uh, oxygen can attack phosphorus. Now we'll have this uh, phosphorus 5, and uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, called a beta-ene, and once this is formed, it just spontaneously eliminates triphenylphosphine oxide, like you see here, to generate the alkene. Okay? All right. So let's look at one of the major synthetic advantages of the Wittig reaction, and that's that you have complete control over where the carbon-carbon double bond is going to end up. So let's imagine the conversion of cyclohexanone into the alkene that I just circled here. And let's look at two different ways to do this. Okay, one is the Wittig reaction, and this produces this in one step. Another way you could imagine doing this is to add the Grignard reagent, okay, with three carbons in it, That makes that compound. Then you could perform a dehydration and, and conceivably produce that, but that will not be quite as good, right? Because dehydration, uh, there are actually two different products you can make here, okay? The top one is better. Examination of the mechanism reveals that the CC has to end up where the C double bond O used to be when you use the Wittig reaction, okay? So, in the Wittig reagent, you take the C double bond C, C double bond O, and it gets replaced with a C double bond C, and uh, whatever is uh, accompanying the phosphonium salt ends up in your product like that. Okay? And the second one, it's governed by Saitsev's rules. And both of these alkenes um, that we have here, the desired one and the undesired one in green are both possible. They're both trisubstituted alkenes, and uh, we could get either one. St. Seth's rule just says we get the more stable one. This one here is probably the most uh, uh, stable, okay, not because of alkene substitution pattern, but because of uh, some ring conformational effects that make the alkene more stable when it's inside of a ring than outside of a ring. Okay, let's look at how we make a phosphonium salt. A phosphonium salt is made by performing the SN2 reaction that you see here. This is the most common synthetic route. Okay, lone pair of phosphorus uh, displaces the halide to give you the phosphonium salt. Most of the things doing the SN2 reaction we've seen to date have a negative charge, and they produce a neutral compound. 
Triphenylphosphine is a neutral compound, so it's going to end up producing a positively charged compound. Okay, the hydrogens next to phosphorus in the phosphonium salt have a pK of about 19. And they can be deprotonated with strong alkoxide bases like potassium t-butoxide. That's uh, probably not the ideal one because the reaction's really just an equilibrium with that. Uh, if you use an alkyl lithium like n-butyl lithium, the reaction, the deprotonation process goes to completion and you get the phosphorine that you see here. There's a lot of uh, interesting uh, structural issues concerning the phosphorine. For instance, why, uh, why is the pKa so low? Okay. We could say that because the negative charge is beside of a positive charge, it's counterbalanced, and that stabilizes it uh, to some extent. Long ago, it was postulated that you could use the 3D orbitals at phosphorus, which are empty but technically uh, not too high of energy uh, above that since you're already filling the 3s and 3d shell when you fill the valence shell okay so you could uh, invoke the 3d orbitals okay uh, i'll just draw that here just for the fun okay so the 3d orbital would be empty Okay, and we could have a carbanion like so, and we could overlap it like that. So that was postulated many years ago. However, recent uh, computational studies of Wittig reagents really suggest that this, uh, this uh, resonance form with a carbon-phosphorus double bond is really not all that important. So the resonance form over here is really the more important one. Okay, but you'll see the Wittig reagents uh, or phosphorines very often written as compounds with carbon phosphorus double bonds. Okay, all right, let's look at a synthesis problem that involves the Wittig reaction. Design a synthesis that produces no isomeric alkenes of this compound here. And this little phrase produces no isomeric alkenes is often a cue to use the Wittig reaction, okay? Because other methods we know, like dehydration and dehydrohalogenation for making carbon-carbon double bonds, have this deal where uh, they follow state steps rule, and you get the more substituted one, or if it's uh, in a cyclic system, uh, stereochemistry can also uh, control where it ends up, or stereochemistry of hydrogen and halogen and a dehydrohalogenation, for example. All right, so how do we do this? All right, so we need to think about what is the immediate precursor compound. All right. And so if we're going to use the Wittig reaction, this becomes our, uh, the molecule we really want to synthesize from our designated starting material here. Okay? All right. So we know that we can turn alkenes into alcohols, right? But we don't have any reactions that turn alkenes directly into ketones. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to turn the alkene into the alcohol and then oxidize the alcohol later to the ketone. All right, so uh, this is the immediate last step of the reaction, the Wittig reaction involving cyclohexanone and the Wittig reagent that you see there. All right, before that, uh, we're going to convert the alkene to the alcohol. The reagent that'll do that is uh, hydroboration followed by oxidation, or we could uh, do a oxymercuration reduction procedure, or we could imagine uh, a third method 
uh, people typically don't like this one quite as much, but it really doesn't matter which of these three methods we use because this is a symmetrical alkene and uh, we don't worry about Markovnikov's rule or the regiochemistry of where this goes. Operationally, this one is the easiest one to do, uh, probably the most reliable, so we'll use that one. Okay. So we're going to convert it to the alcohol. We're going to oxidize the alcohol. Uh, since this is, alcohol is secondary, we I just have PCC here, but we could use uh, H2CrO4 as well because we don't, we're not really worried about over oxidation in this case. And then the Wittig reaction in the last step would complete the synthesis. Okay, let's look at some other issues uh, associated with uh, carbonyl group addition. One of the is uh, stereoselectivity when you have an additional chiral center present. Okay, and the rule here is the same as uh, additions to alkenes. We get, uh, in most cases, attack from the sterically less hindered side, okay? All right, so if we use that as our governing principle, uh, adding methyl greenyard to this compound right here is going to produce as our major product the compound where the methyls are on opposite faces of the molecule. This is because when you look down here at this model, the top side is hindered by the methyl group. The bottom side is pretty much free, so a nucleophile has an easier time passing through on the bottom side. If it comes from the top side, the methyl group is going to get in its way, so we typically don't see quite as much product coming from that. Okay, So our major product is going to be the one that we circled up there at the top. All right, let's imagine this compound right here reacting with phenyl lithium. Okay, if we look at this diagram over here, we see that the top is the less hindered side. This side, uh, remember, I haven't drawn the hydrogens, but they're still there. Okay, and any nucleophile that comes by is going to get uh, going to be hindered by interference with that group down there, okay? And we should expect this as uh, pretty much the only product we're going to get from this reaction, okay? So like other reactions that we had long ago in Chapter 6 that convert sp2 carbon to sp3 carbon, the governing principle here is the same. You attack from the less hindered side. All right, let's uh, look at one final issue and this is the oxidation reactions. Okay, so if you recall from discussions back in the alcohol chapter, if we take a primary alcohol, we have to be very careful how we oxidize it. Okay, when we treat it with a Jones reagent, which involves doing the reaction in water with acid present, we cannot stop at the aldehyde stage here. Uh, and this is because when we're doing this in aqueous H2SO4, we're going to be making the hydrate. And the hydrate is also an alcohol. So this hydrate undergoes the oxidation as well. So chromium-6 added to the hydrate now converts it to the carboxylic acid. So the real reason that PCC works is because it's performed in the absence of water. And it's in an organic solvent. Okay, all right, um, so chromium-6 
Jones reagent is one reagent that will convert an aldehyde to a carboxylic acid. We could take, uh, if we already had the carboxylic acid isolated, we could use uh, the Jones reagent to uh, convert that to the carboxylic acid. All right, more selective reagents that do this include Tollens reagent, which is shown here, uh, a silver one complex, and uh, copper tartrate, also referred to as a uh, Benedict reagent, okay? All right, so if we treat an aldehyde with one of these reagents, it'll also convert to the carboxylic acid. In the days before spectroscopy, this was actually used as a test for an aldehyde, okay? So well, what happened here is that you start with silver plus and you go to silver zero, which doesn't have any solubility and it plates out on the side of the glass. So you would see your solution turn into a, a mirror, basically, and that would be proof or a good evidence, rather, that you had an aldehyde present. Okay, these are uh, a little bit more selective because uh, they'll perform the oxidation in the presence of alcohol groups. Okay, so if you took a molecule like glucose that has a lot of hydroxy groups and an aldehyde group and treated it with any source of chromium-6, you have a very explosive, very violent reaction on your hands. You probably uh, see flames present and you'd see, uh, see CO2 being produced, okay? Whereas uh, Tollens reagent would give you mostly the uh, gluconic acid. We'll, we're going to see uh, when we talk about carbohydrates that they're re special reagents even better than Tollens reagent. Uh, but if, if you want to convert an aldehyde into a carboxylic acid, there are milder reagents than, uh, than the chromium-6 reagents that you saw previously that you can use for that transformation. All right, so if you oxidize a ketone, of course, uh, we have a kind of a problem here, right? Uh, the oxidation of the aldehyde broke a CH bond. And we've seen lots of reactions that affect CH bonds. But the uh, analogous oxidation of a ketone has to break a CC bond. So these are much harder. Okay. Uh, the reaction that will do this is called the bayer villiger reaction. And I looked it up. Uh, actually, I believe there's an I there instead of an A. All right. So... In the bayer villiger reaction, we're going to take a peroxy acid like we saw for making epoxides. Okay. And this is going to make the corresponding ester. Okay, if the ketone is unsymmetrical, like the two different R groups, like I've shown here, we have two different products, uh, depending on whether you put the oxygen on the left side or the right side. Okay. Let's look at the mechanism for the bayer villiger reaction. First, a process that's totally analogous to hemiacetal formation occurs. Once you have this, a migration occurs where the carboxylate is the leaving group. Normally, we don't think of carboxylates as all that great of leaving groups, but there's a special thing going on here. This is a very weak bond. Okay, so this bond, the oxygen-oxygen bond, is quite weak. It wants to break, and this is a good way to break it. All right. In this case, I migrated R2, but I could have also migrated R1. Okay, and this produces finally the ester here and the uh, carboxylic acid. All right, the net result here, let me just diagram what is the net result. 
Okay. The extra oxygen in the peroxy acid just magic. Well, I don't want to say magically inserts itself there, but it basically now ends up between one of the R groups and the carbonyl group. Okay, how do we know which group migrates? Yeah, this is the principle. In general, the group that best stabilizes a carbocation migrates. All right, so this compound here, 2-methylcyclohexanone, when it does the bayer villiger reaction, we're going to treat it with peroxyacetic acid, shown here. It's going to make this compound right here exclusively, and this is because this is, uh, well, if we look at the group that's migrating, it, it, there's a higher degree of alkyl substitution. I, I, I'll call this one a, a tertiary carbon, this one a secondary carbon. All right, so when it migrates, it kind of migrates as this uh, pseudo-carbocation here, and that's what uh, determines the uh, preference. If we take the compound shown here that has two chlorines on one side, uh, I'm treating it with peroxyformic acid here, we would expect to get this compound. Sorry, I forgot to draw the oxygen there. Okay, uh, and this is because uh, these chlorines are electron withdrawing groups. So, yeah, you know, th this is not a good as good a place for a carbocation here. And uh, we see that this uh, this group migrates preferentially. Okay. Uh, Okay, so if we had a carbocation on the other side, it would be stabilized by the electron withdrawing uh, chlorines. Okay, this is a quaternary carbon. This is a secondary carbon, so the oxygen is going to end up between the carbonyl group and the quaternary carbon. And in this case, uh, we're going to produce that compound exclusively. Okay. All right, so let's do a, a problem here. We're going to predict the product of each reaction, okay? And try to uh, be specific as to stereochemistry as you do this. All right, so here we're going to make, uh, we're going to do the Greenard addition. But on one side, we have a CH2 group, and on the other side, we have a quaternary carbon. So this side here is going to be more hindered. Thus, the predicted product is the one where methyl is down. Methyl is up, comes in from the side that's opposite the quaternary carbon, and we end up with the product that you see here. Okay. Something I forgot to say about the Wittig uh, the bayer villiger reaction uh, is that it migrates with retention of configuration. You do not invert the stereochemistry at the carbon. Okay, so uh, let's go back there. Yeah, so as it migrates, notice that it's really going just going from one side to the other. There's a, and there's a, no change in stereochemistry as we do this. All right, so let's uh, look at uh, this one here. This one has some stereochemistry. All the other examples didn't. All right, this side is secondary. This side is tertiary. Our oxygen is going to go here. And it's going to go with retention. So we're going to, hydrogen is still going to be up. And uh, this is the product that we would expect from this reaction right here. All right. So here's the uh, sugar. Let's see. I, I guess this is called uh, erythrose. You'll look at uh, sugars later in this class. But uh, it's a compound that has aldehyde and hydroxy groups in it. If we treated this with uh, potassium chromate, we probably wouldn't see much uh, selectivity. Uh, and 
you find in these highly oxygenated systems, you can also cleave the CC bonds. So what you would see is carbon dioxide is your product from that reaction. Okay, it's a very exothermic reaction. However, Tallinn's reaction would be much, reagent would be much milder and would very likely produce the uh, carboxylic acid as the uh, primary product. Okay, all right, so this is where we're going to stop this video. The next ones uh, are going to deal with spectroscopy and it's going to have some uh, additional problems uh, on them. Okay, so we'll stop this one here for now.